recording. Here we are. Oh, it's recording. So I'll put myself centre and I'll make a start. Hello, my name's Rob McNeely, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce Michael, Dr. Michael Yapko today. Uh, I've known Michael for more than 30 years, and uh, I have a huge respect for what he does, who he is. And I always tell students that if you want to know what's happening in the world of therapy and in the world generally, ask Michael. He seems to have a, a direct uh, access, very astute observer of trends and, and uh, uh, what, what's happening. He's written some groundbreaking books, uh, the textbook, uh, Trans Work, which is uh, widely regarded as the textbook for hypnosis. His other books uh, have been groundbreaking in the uh, use of strategies in therapy, in the area of sexual abuse recovery, uh, in the area of using hypnosis for depression, and most recently in relation to mindfulness. Uh, Michael uh, is a preeminent teacher of hypnosis and I regard him as one of the most active and important ambassadors for hypnosis in the globe. He's teaching workshops in the US, in Canada, in Europe, and Scandinavia, in Australia. And over the last few years has been running very highly regarded 100-hour uh, workshops in a number of locations around the world. So. Uh, it's a real pleasure, Michael, to, to have this opportunity for you to speak about your work and, and uh, what you make of this. And I'm very grateful for your uh, generosity in giving you time. You're just back from Australia just a couple of days ago, I think. Yeah, I just got back not even two days ago. Okay. So I'm a little bit jet lagged, but happy. It's, and it's my pleasure to be talking to you, Rob, as always. Uh, that's great. Great. Thank you so much. Could you say, just say a few words about uh, your background, how come you got involved in this work, and uh, just what you're about, what your passion is? Oh, well, that's a big <laughs> question, a yeah. global question. Um, I can sure. kind of pick it apart and figure out how to answer it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I'm a clinical psychologist, and I'm interested in doing treatment, and you know, my passion is in helping people who are suffering uh, reduce their suffering. I think it's a calling for anybody who goes into the mental health profession uh, or the health professions in general. Mm -hmm. So there's a strong desire to contribute in that way to people's lives. Mm. And, of course, the, the challenge is how do you do that in the most expedient way possible, the most effective way possible? Mm. And I think that um, once you start practicing therapy and realize that the tools of the trade are your words and how you introduce ideas to people and how you help people get absorbed in different ways of thinking about things, mm. it's actually a pretty short pathway to hypnosis mm. where the whole uh, science and art revolves around how we use words and ideas to influence people to feel better and not only feel better, but be better. Mm. So that's, that's in a nutshell, really, what, what it's all about for me. Yes. And I noticed that uh, you and I have parallel paths in some ways that um, I think you stopped seeing clients in practice so that you could concentrate on teaching. What, what, was, what yeah. happened there? Well, I'm I'm, uh, I'm getting up in years, Rob. <laughs> and, uh, you know, for for more than thirty years, I basically worked three full time jobs of maintaining a full time clinical practice, writing books, and teaching workshops. Mm. And uh, about well, six years ago now, I decided something had to give before I went up in flames. <laughs> and uh, I decided that really, the, the as much as I enjoyed clinical practice for you know those thirty odd years, that wasn't really the best use of my time. That for every one hour that I was spending with a client, mm. literally twenty thousand more people were becoming clinically depressed, and it was mm. starting to 
feel a little bit like emptying the ocean with a bucket. Yep. And so I really wanted to do some things that reached larger audiences. Uh, it's what the books have always been about, and it's what the workshops have always been about. But this unique um, technological era that we live in, uh, just as we're doing right now by having this conversation face-to-face from 7,000 miles away, mm-hmm. uh, pretty remarkable. And so I'm really still learning how to uh, develop a, a message and get it to a wider audience. Uh, I think that uh, especially re- relative to the things that I'm interested in, namely major depression, the most common problem, uh, mood problem that we're asked to treat as clinicians, Mm -hmm. there's so much great information, so much valuable uh, perspective that we have evolved that can really make a huge difference, not just in terms of treatment, but also in terms of prevention. And then the question is, why isn't the information reaching people? So uh, I really want to uh, uh, continue to explore now new ways of uh, of reaching more people and that was why uh, I basically decided six years ago that I would gradually retire from clinical practice which I have now done completely mm-hmm. and uh, and I'm still working as hard as ever just uh, my time going in other directions okay but, you know that all uh, it's almost a cliche that if you give someone a fish they'll they have a meal but if you teach them how to fish they, they can feed themselves for the rest of their life and uh, that's right. There's something about teaching. It's such a joy when you see people connect with ideas and possibilities and skills that they can then take into their practice and, and maybe even into their teaching. But uh, uh, well, you, you know that to be true from the workshops that you do. That that uh, people people get very attached to you and and they hear you say things that they've never really thought about before and mm. and. Um, in a moment, their their universe expands in some way, yeah. and uh, you know, and and it's empowering. And and especially when you're in the therapy business, is there ever a time that you're going to see a client that you're not going to want to empower? Yes. So, uh, yeah. Empowerment is a is a constant in this field, mm. and the, the the challenge is how many different ways can we try and do for people. And and as far as empowerment is concerned, that applies also to the clinicians because, um, you know, so often uh, any clinician is going to feel at times overwhelmed, overpowered, incompetent, you're stuck. And uh, I think one of the the joys that I uh, have in in teaching this work is seeing how some relatively simple ideas and experiences and skills can really help to increase the options that clinicians have so that then they can bring that and uh, increase the options that the clients have access to. Agreed. And, you know, something doesn't have to be deep and profound to be helpful. You know, (laughs) a lot of times all, all that's going on in therapy is your client comes in banging their head and then they say, I keep banging my head and you shake your fist at them and say, stop that. And then they stop that and send you a Christmas card every year and tell you how you change their life. <laughs> a lot of times the, the things that it takes to help people aren't that complicated. Yeah. I wish it was always that way. A lot of times things can get quite complicated, but, mm. you know, uh, but people get stuck. Uh, you know, each of us has a blind spot mm. and, you know, fortunately, somebody else doesn't share the same blind spot and can tell you what you're missing. And, you know, in, in a moment, you know, things can improve dramatically. Yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's my experience that often when we have a problem, when we're talking about complexity, often we have a problem because we complexify something which is uh, just there and somehow seeing that it oh, I just need to stop banging my head on the wall. Oh, it's that simple. Oh, okay. I don't need to understand my childhood traumas and potty dragging and so on. <laughs> I, I like your word complexify. I, I forgot that you kind of make up your own language as you go, Rob. That's, <laughs> it's like my, my secretary who I had for 17 years, a woman I love named Linda, used to make up words, but they were so right on. You know, she, she would say, I, I have to go get my ring smallened. 
And uh, gee, you know, I, th I think we need to big in this part of the, uh, the <laughs> age. And you know, okay, she makes up her own words, but they're perfect. So, so we, we, we can we can say that we're in the business of simplificationalizing. So that could be. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> so, could you say something then um, to the question: Why would any clinician want to learn about hypnosis? Well, you know, I have a couple of answers to that. Okay. One is the the cynical answer, which is clinicians don't want to learn hypnosis, which <laughs> is why, which is why. Uh, yeah, you know, the, the the societies are struggling, and the uh, uh, you know the, the the number of people entering the field is not increasing, mm -hmm. and, and that is a, a great puzzlement for all of us who are in the field who uh, who have dedicated our lives to understanding these skills, and more than that, the, the profound implications of these skills. Mm. Um, so, you know, it's dis it's actually discouraging to me that after 40 years of, of investing my life in trying to advance hypnosis, that, that people still don't get it because the, you know, the, the, the baggage that hypnosis carries, you know, you, you say, let's do hypnosis and people freak out and you say, okay, we won't do hypnosis, but let's just do some kind of focused, attentional relaxation sort of thing. And they go, okay, well, that's fine. <laughs> and uh, you know that people still react to the word, not to the to the experience of it. And I, and I think really the best uh, the best evidence for that is look at what happens when parallels, strong parallels like mindfulness, come along, and they have you know the the, the uh, desirable philosophical frame. Gee, this has been practiced by Buddhists for 2,500 years, and yet the, the techniques are uh, hugely overlapping with hypnosis and in some ways are considerably weaker in practice than hypnosis, but it doesn't carry all of that baggage. And so, you know, until you go to Las Vegas and see people doing sexy mindfulness shows, uh, you, you, you won't run into that kind of a problem. Mm. Now, the, now, more to the heart of your question. Before you go on, I uh, want, to, want to give you a chance to, to make that marvelous quip about uh, the picnic. Why is uh why is hypnosis? Uh, why, why, why is hypnosis still considered the crazy cousin that's not welcome at the family picnic? Yes. Um, it yeah, really captures the mood of it. Too. Well, it does. It it just highlights that the uh, the unfortunate side of it, which is that hypnosis has has already contributed so much to our, mm. our understanding of neuroscience, neuroplasticity, neurogenesis. Mm. It has contributed greatly to our understanding of epigenetics and, and environmental influences on internal processes and genetic expression. Mm. It's contributed a lot to our understanding of social psychology and, and, and social dynamics like conformity, persuasion, um, influence, attraction, uh, the power of the therapeutic alliance. Uh, it, it, hypnosis has yielded a tremendous amount of insight into so many important things, but uh, I think that most people don't really grasp that. And I, I actually think I, uh, the, where the problem is, is in graduate training. Um, you know, that, that because hypnosis courses aren't offered as a part of people's graduate training, they're not exposed to it during their academic pursuits and they start to get established in their own way of doing things, their own therapeutic style, their own therapeutic model. And then when they come out of school and get into clinical practice, to have to go learn another modality, it seems to them, is too much. It's, it, 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 it clearly isn't mainstream or they would have learned it in graduate school. And so um, it, hypnosis ends up being marginalized. And, and uh, so that that's one part of the problem, I think another part of the problem is that hypnosis itself has kind of shot itself in the foot and then wonders why it's limping, that because hypnosis thinks of itself, I'm speaking in generalizations, of course, but because the, the hypnosis professionals think of themselves as so specialized and so advanced and so um, 
um, beyond what other people are doing, that hasn't really attracted people either. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that was really why I, I chose to write the book, research and write the book, Mindfulness and Hypnosis, that instead of you know, saying hypnosis is so special and so different than anything else, I want to start reaching out across modalities to be able to say, here are the parallels. Here's what's hypnotic about doing mindfulness or hypnotic about doing EMDR or hypnotic about doing CBT or hypnotic about almost any therapy you can name. Mm. Uh, and, and can we identify the, the, the common denominators? And certainly, I've already mentioned a few of them. You know, the, the role of suggestion is inevitable. The, the, the power of words is inevitable. The necessity to form the therapeutic alliance is inevitable in treatment. Mm. And, uh, and yet, these are not the things that are taught. And so, you know, bottom line, kind of a long-winded answer, but I, I think that's the reason why hypnosis hasn't been increasing in people's awareness and in people's clinical practices I think it just seems too off the beaten path and like too much hassle. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's one of the motivations for having the series of, of interviews so that maybe in some small way, uh, some butterfly effect maybe, but uh, maybe just wishful thinking, but that's, that's my wish. In well, it is wishful thinking, but you got to start with that if you intend to do anything, you know, yeah. the whole idea is let's, let's be proactive about it. And, yeah. Yeah. and and, and that's what you're doing is giving people the chance to listen to this and yeah. get a perspective that says, you know, let, let's stop talking about how unique hypnosis is and even how dangerous hypnosis is. And let's start talking about how it's pretty much a part of everything we do anyway. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And I interrupted you. You were going to, to go on and say something about uh, what uh, the benefits, the why someone might, you, you've spoken eloquently about, why why people are not interested and yeah. uh, you're going to say something about why people might be interested what benefits well, they get you know if, if you take um doing clinical work seriously uh and you, and you genuinely appreciate that every minute of every hour that you spend with someone is meant to help this person move in a better direction mm. is there any doubt that people learn more easily when they're focused, when they're relaxed, and that in and of itself is enough reason to want to learn hypnosis. Mm -hmm. But when we consider that the most common disorders that we are asked to treat, statistically anxiety number one, major depression number two, and both of these disorders that are so prevalent are so highly responsive to placebo interventions and it highlights that we are dealing with disorders that are largely disorders of perspective mm -hmm. and and hypnosis gives us a lot of insight into how do people get absorbed in perspective how does a belief translate into an emotional response a behavioral response a physiological response mm -hmm. how can we grab someone's attention and direct it in ways that are expansive rather than self-limiting, in ways that empower people. And, you know, the, the, the common mythology about hypnosis is that somehow this is going to disempower people. And, of course, if that was the, the truth, it wouldn't interest me in the least. But what's impressive to me about hypnosis is its capacity to empower people, to help people connect to these, these abilities they have that they didn't know they have. When, when you take, for example, someone who is suffering physical pain, and this person learns how to regulate awareness for pain sensations in their body, um, this person feels like they got their life back. This person feels like they're amazed with themselves because they didn't know that they could do that. Mm. And all hypnosis does is creates a context for people to learn those skills. It isn't even the hypnosis that does it. It's, it's the, 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 the creation of this special space and time where this person can go inside and find these 
abilities with, with a really good guide and start to use them in new ways that force them to expand their self-definition. Mm. Uh, you know, encourage them in the most forceful of ways to redefine themselves in much more uh, broad terms, powerful terms, and self-aware terms. And, you know, all things that wouldn't, wouldn't we want that for any therapy, but what a difference to approach this in a very laborious, conversational, rational way versus being able to appreciate that people are capable of rationality, but they're not rational. Mm. And, and the ability to engage with all the dimensions of someone rather than just select dimensions. Mm. So uh, I think there are lots and lots of compelling reasons to want to learn hypnosis. And certainly for, from most clinicians' perspective, the single most compelling reason is because it works. Because there's enough therapeutic efficacy data to show that when you do therapy without hypnosis and you do the same therapy with hypnosis, that the addition of the hypnosis does increase the efficiency of the treatment, whatever the treatment is. That's a pretty robust finding in the research literature. And that, too, justifies hypnosis. It works. Yeah, yeah. There's another part to, uh, to complement what you're saying about uh, focus and, and, uh, and expansiveness that I've noticed that when people are in the throes of uh, anxiety or depression, uh, we could say metaphorically that they are hypnotized by the anxiety symptoms or the depressive experiences. And part of what the expansiveness that you're talking about can allow, and again, I'm speaking metaphorically, can allow someone to come out of the bad trance, out of the bad hypnosis, the anxiety and hypnosis can be thought of. As. Same with, with uh, post-trauma and, and, and pain. You know, if you get pain, well, you know, it, uh, that's your experience. You get focused and absorbed on the pain in a way hypnotized by the pain. So that by coming out of the unwanted hypnosis, then there's the expansiveness that you're speaking about so that people have more options and can, can be empowered and can be more, they can be behind the driving wheel of their life instead of uh, on the, the road to hell driven by, by some kind of weird symptom. Well, what it speaks to is what you focus on determines your quality of experience. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, what a difference to focus on what's wrong versus focusing on what's right. Yeah. Uh, focusing on what limits you versus focusing on what enhances you. Yes. And in that respect, that's really what you're doing hypnotically is guiding the person's attention in a different direction. Yeah. And, and uh, so that the person feels like they have the ability to start to pay attention to things that they never really paid attention to before. Yes, I never paid attention or, and never even thought of the possibility of looking at that as something to pay attention to. Well, this is one of the, the vulnerabilities of the human mind. You know, we, we are apparently, as far as I can tell, genetically programmed to be believers. And, uh, yeah. you know, people feel the need to adopt a belief system, whether it's a religious belief system, a psychotherapy model, Mm -hmm. uh, a particular philosophy, uh, we're, we're believers. And, and what we're really examining is what, what are the qualities of those beliefs and do they increase our range of choices or do they work against us in some way? But the, the problem is people don't realize how arbitrary their beliefs are, how malleable their beliefs are. You know, they, they get stuck in this idea that this is what I think, this is what I feel, this is what I believe to be true, and so it's true. And it's, it's, it's one of the reasons why I like cognitive behavioral therapy so much, you know, from, from that standpoint, is it, it has a very elegant way of challenging people's beliefs by not directly contradicting them, but instead by saying, gee, that's a really interesting belief you have. How can we find out whether it's true or not? Mm -hmm. and, and invite that quality of experimentation that, for many people, it's the first time that they start to discover that what they believe may not necessarily be true. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what really what it takes is a, uh, 
a willingness to, to engage with your beliefs long enough to test them. You know, if they're working for you, fine, leave them alone. But the ones that people come into therapy for are the ones that aren't working for them. So, you know, it's, it's a great opportunity to loosen the person up hypnotically, to entertain the possibility that there are other ways of looking at something, and then sending them out into the world to do some experimenting and, and letting those those suggestions from the hypnosis bubble up in the situations that they find themselves in where all of a sudden they can realize, wow, you know, I guess I was wrong about that. I don't know whether you know of Harry Palmer. He was an American, one of these personal development programs called Avatar. And he, he coined a, a phrase. He said, believing is seeing. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, he had some amusing ways of dealing with that and, and, one of the ways that he did it was what he called discreating. You hold one belief and you, at the same time, hold the opposite belief. And somehow, if you can hold them both together, they discreate the thing and there's some space and some freedom. But that's just another way of getting to what you're saying. Well, you know, the, the thing is, any belief has the potential to be valuable or even true in some instances. Sure. The problem, that, that's all we're really trying to do is in, introduce selectivity that yeah. you know here, here's where this is true but here's where this isn't true yeah yeah i mean we can say that uh thinking that believing that the world is flat is a very useful belief if you're building a tennis court it's not very useful if you're trying to get in a boat and go a long way but uh as you say the, the beliefs can be useful but uh, there needs uh, to be selectivity yes yeah, selectivity yeah context. So that's that's uh, it's lovely to hear you speak so clearly about the benefits of um, that for any clinician that, that could bring to themselves and to their efficacy and to how they can help their clients by learning hypnosis. A, what clinician yeah. would want their client to be more focused and more receptive? Yes, yes, yes. On something useful. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. Seems pretty obvious to me. <laughs> well, we agree on that. Um, and uh, then as a, an extension of that, could you say something about why someone might want to learn about Ericksonian hypnosis uh, as distinct from um, a more form, formal or uh, traditional uh, expression of, or, or way of using hypnosis? Well, you know, the, the field of hypnosis has a very rich history and a very rich set of traditions. And there have been many people along the way who have been very um, powerful in their their influence on the field. Mm -hmm. and so there, there are different models of hypnosis, just as there are different models of psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. And as my, you know, my perspective about it is that Erickson, you know, the, introduced a, a set of innovations uh, that stood out markedly against the prevailing uh, perspectives about hypnosis at the time. Uh, Erickson was starting to develop his perspective when he was a young man in his 20s. Uh, and and uh, uh, at the time, this was in the 1920s. Uh, the only model of hypnosis that there was was a very direct authoritarian tell people what to do kind of an approach. And there were a lot of people that were absolutely fine with that. People who responded well to it, people who did dramatic things, surgeries with hypnosis using that kind of direct authoritarian sort of command approach to hypnosis. But what Erickson introduced as an innovation was based on the recognition that there is a significant percentage of people who don't really want to be told what to do. And instead of having hypnosis imposed upon them through the hypnotist techniques, he evolved a style of more eliciting from the person their own hypnotic capacities and what a difference to view hypnosis as something between people versus the more traditional view of viewing hypnosis as an innate capacity of the individual. And they either have the ability or they don't. 
which is why they would do suggestibility testing to find out if someone had that ability or not. But as we've learned more and more about hypnosis, and really as, as prominent as Erickson was, he wasn't a researcher. And it was really an interesting time in the 1960s when a researcher by the name of Ted Barber, TX Barber, mm -hmm. started to examine the question, do we really need to call it hypnosis? Do we really need to go through the formality of an induction ritual in order to get hypnotic responses? So he did a very clever series of experiments in which he simply asked people to imagine responses, imagine numbness in their hand or imagine memories. And he got the same degree of, of uh, response and the same quality of response as people going through formal hypnotic induction rituals. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, Erickson was 30 years ahead of that in realizing that the ritual wasn't necessary, just the suggestions were necessary. Mm -hmm. And so we come back again to how do we offer suggestions in the most respectful way possible to the broadest population of people possible. And that is the compelling reason to want to learn Ericksonian approaches. It simply allows you to make contact with another segment of the client population, the people who have hypnotic talents, who aren't going to connect with those talents through you yelling at them and telling them what to do. So it's, again, much more about creating a comfortable environment for people to be willing to explore. And I think that's what is really nice about the Ericksonian approach is it's gentler. It is less direct. It's less demanding. It is more respectful of the person's individual way of responding. Mm. And that is going to be appealing to a, a, another segment of the population. But, you know, every once in a while, you'll have an Ericksonian practitioner who tells their client a metaphor, and the client sits up, opens her eyes, and says, if you have something to tell me, why don't you just tell me straight out, <laughs> and, and met metaphor backfired. Mm -hmm. So, as always, it's not that the wisdom is in the approach or is innate to the techniques. It's about knowing which approach is to use with, with which person. I remember you saying at one of the workshops that I organized, I invited you, I think the first time you came to Australia, uh, that uh, you made a comment that too often uh, metaphors are left uh, like unwanted babies at the doorstep of the unconscious, hoping to be taken in. <laughs> it was a very, uh, very cute uh, observation. Well, you know, the, the, the wisdom of the field at that time had been trust your unconscious. Mm. People People would literally say, trust your unconscious to know the meaning of the metaphor. Trust your unconscious to mm. solve the problem in some magical unconscious way. Mm. And uh, as appealing as that sounds, unfortunately, it just doesn't quite work that way in real life. Well, except when it does. I mean, it's certainly like some people are, will respond to that. Some people will, will respond to being shouted at and told. But a lot of people... Uh, you know, we will value the, the, the flexibility of the clinician to respectfully, as you say, listen to who the client is and tailor the, what their approach is so that it fits the client. And you're right. And, and that's the artistry is whom can you tell a wonderfully elaborate story to mm. and they'll hang on your every word and get it. Mm. And who do you tell a story to and, you know, it just sails right over their head and they miss the <laughs> point and their unconscious never did quite get it. So, Yeah, well, I think as long as we're working with human beings, we're, we are in the company of very mysterious creatures. Uh, anyone who says, this is the way that it has to be done, this is the technique that will always work, I think they're not worth listening to. Well, I think that was one of the things I really appreciated about Erickson's answer. Not, not long before he passed away, uh, I don't know if you remember Paul Carter. Mm. Steve, Steve Gilligan and Paul Carter used to do workshops together a lot in the 70s and 80s. Yes. And Paul Carter asked Erickson directly, how long do you think it should take to become proficient with hypnosis? <laughs> and 
and Erickson kind of sat there and did his bobbing and weaving sort of routine with his head before he finally said, well, I've been doing hypnosis for more than 50 years. I've written more than a dozen books on the subject, published more than 100 articles on the subject. I've hypnotized thousands and thousands of people. And I think I'm starting to get the hang of it. <laughs> uh, there's something so refreshing about that idea, isn't it, for, for all of us, you know? And, it's realistic, you know, that, that when you're dealing with human beings, you're dealing with complexities yeah. that are inherent. You know, it's, it's not like any other job where you, you know, take an object off the assembly line, put it in a box, wrap the box up, put it in a mailing chute, and then do it again. You know, it's a, where, where it's a very finite set of moves. This, this is, yeah. you know, when, when, when do you know people well enough? When, when do you know enough therapy? And yeah. the answer is you never know enough. It's always a growth-oriented process. And yeah. for a lot of us, that's what turns us on to this field. And for other people, that's what turns them off. Exactly. Yeah. They, they want it to be more precise and more well-defined. I remember when I first started doing this work, um, I learned a traditional approach and to have, have someone go into hypnosis, it was a matter of asking them to <clears throat> stare at a spot and then relax their toes and relax their feet and so on. And uh, I was seeing some number of people every day going through the same process. And I can't tell you how bored it was, boring it was. And I had trouble staying awake sometimes. It was just, uh, it was just awful. And, and, and I think I still help some people. Some people managed to get what they needed in spite of what I was doing or as well as what I was doing. But when mm. I met Erickson, there was something very, uh, it was like coming home. It was something very human and respectful and uh, uh, marvellous about it for me. Well, you know, he's had that effect on a lot of clinicians. He mm -hmm. hasn't had that effect on researchers. Mm -hmm. and and, and, you know, that we're living at a time when the science trumps the art. Yes. And, and uh, you know, people, you know, you, any, any statement you make, people want to know where the empirical support for that statement is. Okay. And so it has been uh, a, a value of mine to stay current with the research literature, mm -hmm. but, but also to appreciate that that no matter how much science you try and jam into hypnosis it's still ultimately going to be about artistry it's yeah. still going to be about what you decide to say and how you decide to say it and when you decide to say it mm -hmm. and uh, so I, I like the idea of having some empirical support but for me the greater challenge is how do we take these research findings and discover is there a place where it has relevance to a clinical practice uh, and if it does how and if it doesn't leave it by the side of the road uh, you know it's, it's interesting to me uh, not last year but two years ago i was doing a, a workshop at the american society of clinical hypnosis annual conference now the american society is uh, pretty internally divided between researchers and practitioners and traditionalists versus Ericksonians and th there are these divisions there but I had I don't know two or three hundred people in a room and we got onto the subject of suggestibility testing and I asked okay so how many of you guys administer hypnotic suggestibility tests to your clients and one hand went up and all the other hands stayed down mm. Nobody does that. Now, from a research perspective, these guys are advocating all the time, making use of tests and, you know, analyzing their reliability and their validity and cross-cultural populations and mm -hmm. gender differences and age differences and suggest responses to suggestibility tests. And clinicians could not care less about that. You know, their, their attitude is if you want to find out whether somebody can be hypnotized them, hypnotize them, hypnotize them. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, let, let's, let's learn from the person's actual responses in a clinical context mm. as opposed to some hypothetical response to an arbitrary suggestion mm. such as given in a, in a test. Yeah. So you know, there's, there is that gap that exists between researchers and clinicians, and I don't think we'll ever fully bridge it. But I also think that there's far more interesting things going on in the world of hypnosis research than most 
clinicians seem to know. So uh, I, I do like bringing that piece into the workshops that I do. Yeah. Uh, a couple of comments uh, came to my mind while I was listening to you that I think it was Einstein that said, if you want to know what a scientist do, uh, is up to, look at what they're doing, not what they say they're doing. Because, you know, there's often a difference. And also, I love the comment that Heinz von Thurston made when he said that, uh, this is not a popular thing to say, but he, he wasn't interested in being popular, but he said that uh, for him, science is just another modern day superstition. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a rather radical, radical comment. And another person that I know is not in high favour with you, Werner Earhart, uh, made a comment. He said, it's a problem being half asked, whichever cheek is missing. So I was thinking about the clinical and the, the research and, uh, you know, it's good to have something balanced to sit on. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's not as if the research is irrelevant. Yeah, and sure. yeah, yeah, work yeah. is irrelevant. You know, they, they really both need to inform each other, and and I think that that's valuable. So, if someone were listening to this and they say, "Oh, I, I would like to be more effective in helping my clients to focus on what's useful," but to to take a line from your your audio, you know, focus on feeling good. Uh, if they wanted to do that and they wanted to learn about this, what, how might, what would you recommend as a way for someone to acquire these uh, skills, these, these, these abilities, uh, so they can be more artful, even if it's informed by uh, research? But how can someone learn this art? Well, you know, there are a couple of different things. Um, one is, the whole point of going through a formal hypnosis training is to have a context that is specifically designed to help you acquire those skills. Yep. And, and so, you know, obviously I'm an advocate of formal training. I don't think you can learn to do hypnosis by reading a book any more than you can learn to do therapy by reading a book. You know, there, there's something that you have to do experientially to engage with people and, and learn these skills. So I, th I think that's an important part of it. But I also think it would be valuable for anybody to examine what they're already doing. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you were to, without any hypnosis training at all, if you were to video or audio record your sessions and, and review it line by line, what did you say and how did you say it and how did the client respond to it? You know, why did the client respond to this idea, but they totally brushed off that idea? What was it about their receptivity to this? How did this fit with their beliefs and how did this contradict their beliefs? And, and let's look at what are you already doing that works and how does it work? And, and it would require a greater level of analysis that a lot of clinicians feel comfortable making. It's like what I run into with the mindfulness thing. You know, I thought when I interviewed people for my book, the leaders of the mindfulness field, you know, their, their initial attitude was, don't get that icky hypnosis all over my nice mindfulness. Mm. And then when I sent them the manuscript, which I thought was very thoughtful about how what you do works, I thought they'd be excited by that to have greater insight into how when they do these guided meditations and, and guide people through these experiences, that, that they'd have a better insight into it. I was shocked at how little curiosity they have. Mm. They, they have a, a, a system for how they do things, and they're not interested in picking it apart and asking the question of how does it work. Mm. So that, that's my advice to anybody who's wanting to learn is you'd have to be curious how the things that you say turn into a felt experience. You'd have to be curious how your words stimulate imagery and and sounds and feelings in people you'd have to be curious why when you say something one time the client essentially ignores it and then you say the exact same thing two sessions later and your client goes wow that's amazing <laughs> and then you say well yeah i actually said that to you a couple of sessions ago and they go you did i don't remember you saying that you'd have to be curious about exchanges like that 
you have to be curious why your client comes in and says, you know, I really thought a lot about what you said last week. And then you very tactfully try and ask, well, what did I say last week? Mm-hmm. And then they tell you what you said that was so meaningful to them. And you don't even remember saying it. <laughs> every, every therapist has had that experience. <laughs> but to be curious about how is it that something you could say so offhandedly would have such a lingering impact on someone. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you, if you start to look at therapy in broader terms, that's when hypnosis starts to become more relevant about how these interactions make such a difference in, in the quality of people's experience. Mm-hmm. But if you're not curious about those things, if you just want to learn a technique and apply it, mm. um, you know, which is really amazing to me, but it's how people learn CBT. They, they, they want to learn the technique. Tell me what to say. Tell me what to do. Therapists who are even manualizing treatments, the, the psychotherapy equivalent of hypnotic scripts, you know, both both you and I are very strongly against the use of scripts because we yep. want to respond to the individual as an individual. Yep. You've got other people who are philosophically and pragmatically inclined to script everything and, and make it an, an utterly thoughtless experience. Yeah. But I really, you know, I love what you're saying about being curious and... Uh, like, you know, you said that Erickson just started to get the hang of it after 50 years. And he, uh, my experience of him was that he, he was always curious. And uh, it's something that uh, that uh, we, we could all benefit from. I, I love the derivation of the, the, the word arrogance. You know, it's from the Latin, a regare, which means don't ask a question. And why would you ask a question if you already have the answer? You know, if you have the answer, why be curious about it? So there's a certain humility too that comes along with the curiosity that, that, that uh, they work together rather nicely. You, in my you, can, you can be very proud of your humility, Rob. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm trying not to be too arrogant about it anyhow. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. And, you know, I mean, this is what's so curious about dealing with people's belief systems is, that when you're so rigidly attached to a viewpoint that you, that you can't see it from any other angle, mm. it works against suggestibility. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, that's one of the artistries in doing hypnosis is how do you help detach people, create a little bit of space between themselves and their beliefs so you can introduce something new. Mm. And if you, if you just flat out challenge them or contradict them, they will brush you off in a second. Mm. And I think that's, that's one of the great uses of hypnosis is to create that context, that atmosphere mm. where somebody can be willing to explore what they know or what they think they know. Yeah. So, so that the rigidity becomes, uh, there's a possibility of it softening so that there's some, there's some room to move instead of someone being kind of stuck. And as you say, if you challenge someone, uh, actually, you can harden their stuckness because then the, we will push someone into defending the belief and it becomes even more rigid. So it's, I find it very unhelpful, not, not only in, in therapy, but in life. You know, you try and talk someone into changing their religion or their their uh, what, what kind of computer they like or who they're going to vote for in elections. And you've got to fight to the death on your hands. <laughs> it's, it's generally true. And, and yet... You know, every once in a while you run into someone who's thoughtful, who realizes you're reasonably bright, you're reasonably sane, you have a totally different viewpoint, and they get curious about it. Yeah, sure. And, and you know, you, you, you hope to run into people like that, and you certainly hope to help people in the therapy process get to that kind of a place. Yeah, I think the Dalai Lama was uh, was actively involved in helping to train Christian um uh, priests in, uh, in 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 London at one point, so there was no conflict there. You know, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, there's, that's a, that flexibility is uh, is the, the key. Yeah. Now, so. um, also, I'm curious if if you've got something to say about the the questions that people. I mean, you you you've been teaching uh, 
hypnosis for a long time now, 30 years or more. And uh, not just in the U.S. Yeah, almost 40 years. Almost 40 years. Okay. And uh, not just in the U.S. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm glad next year or this year you're, you're, you're teaching in Iceland. Yeah, I've, uh, I've taught now in more than 30 countries. 30 across countries. Six hmm. continents and, uh, so yeah. what, what, what are the questions? Are there some kind of generic uh, recurring questions that people ask you about hypnosis? Oh, there's a million recurring questions. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Things, things that, you know, the, 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 the Hollywood stereotype, the Las Vegas show stereotype is, is pervasive around the world. Mm. Uh, you know, I, I was just in China in November and doing a lecture. And, you know, first mm. question out of the gate was, you know, can, can you really make people do these things yeah. in hypnosis? And, you know, China is just waking up after all these decades of communism to where they couldn't even talk about psychology. A lecture like I gave in November would, would have been outlawed as little as five years ago. Mm -hmm. And so they're new to psychology and already the mythology is there. Okay. So that, that's one of the persistent questions, no matter what culture I go into and okay. other, other cultures, it's more, uh, tied up with their their belief systems about things in general mm -hmm. so that you know some beliefs about uh, whether it's something like reincarnation and the use of past life regression or whether it's a cultural thing about deeply entrenched religious guilt and and how how to deal with that um, but across cultures across human beings the overlaps far, far outweigh the differences. Mm -hmm. you know, people want to be healthier. They want to make better choices about how they manage their own well-being. They want to be happier. They want to have better relationships. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to have a discussion with their 15-year-old without it turning into a big argument. They, they, they want to be more appreciated on the job. They want to, you know, I mean, the, the things that are just, yep. it's just being human. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so e even as I go around the world and, and go in and out of different cultures, so often I'm in a culture where, you know, there, we don't share a common language where I'm working through translators and, and even with no language similarity and no cultural similarity, it's still so easy to speak to the human part of the person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. parts of the person that are the same no matter what country you go into I had such a funny experience in Tokyo um, three or four years ago I was running a two day workshop there and I had a translator because I speak about two Japanese words um, and uh, uh, I, I always thought of the Japanese culture as being kind of uh, like very proper and you know mask culture anyhow we came back from lunch on the second day and the translator taught me how to say, we hope you had a nice lunch in Japanese. So we get back after the lunch and I said, in Japanese, we hope you had a very nice lunch. And he said in English, we hope you had a very nice lunch. And the, 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 they just fell on the floor. They thought it was hilarious. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was just marvelous to see that commonality that... Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, 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 that's, that's one of the myths about the Japanese. Once you get to know them, they are funny and great sense of humor, and they enjoy good times as much as anybody else. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just a, a belief that uh, that I had that uh, was limiting my appreciation. Of. Well, until you're in the culture, how would you know? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah but I knew. Yeah. Even though I hadn't been in the culture, I already knew Japanese people are like this. I remember yeah. seeing a comedy... Um, a program which said it uh, was interviewing someone in Germany and uh, the interviewer said to this person with a very straight face what what is uh, what is uh, humor like in in Germany and the German said it's like this and that was the that was the interview <laughs> that was the response <laughs> it's so funny it's just uh, just just beautiful just you uh, uh, human yeah I mean, so, what's What's funny is different from culture to culture, but everybody loves fun. Yes, exactly. So is there anything, when you look back about uh, what we've been speaking about for the last while, is there anything else that you might 
want to add uh, anything that we haven't spoken about that you think would be important for people to to listen or to uh, I, I would love to emphasize to people that the literature of hypnosis is broad and deep that uh, any sense of this being even the slightest bit esoteric is a misconception it's a myth that when I talk about all the great neuroscience and studying people and, and what goes on in the brains of people who are undergoing surgeries, for example, without any chemical anesthesia, it, it opens up whole new windows of neuroscience. And the modern, the modern word of hypnosis is attention. You know, that, that when you look at where the research is going, it's studying attentional processes, it's studying in cognitive neuroscience, phenomena like priming and unconscious influences from environmental uh, factors, uh, things that play out hugely in our understandings of how not only the brain works, but how the mind works and how the mind interfaces with the body. And I would just want people to know that there is there is a rigorous science there, just as there is in other uh, other uh, fields that also share that science with art. And to learn the art and to learn the science uh, can only benefit your clients, make your clinical practice stronger, and build your own confidence as a clinician that you have more ways of addressing the kinds of despairing conditions that people come in presenting. Mm -hmm. The fact that there is a, a worldwide network of people who are interested in hypnosis, the International Society of Hypnosis has a component branches in more than three dozen countries. You have some of the finest clinicians and researchers on the planet who are part of the hypnosis community, and there's a reason. And when you start to see the relevance of hypnosis across other approaches, uh, there's a lot of good reason to want to learn hypnosis. And I hope that our discussion um, makes people aware of that and stimulates their curiosity to learn what's hypnotic about what they're already doing and what's relevant to what they're already doing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's beautiful, Michael. And... Uh... Again, thank you so much for sharing your experience. And if, if I'm not being presumptuous, uh, thank you for all that you're doing to let more people know about these, uh, this learning possibility of what you're already doing around the world. It's very... It's my and if you know, people want more information, they can always go to my website, yapko.com, Y-A-P-K-O.com, and see what kinds of things are going on. And uh, they can also go to the organizational websites, the Australian Society of Hypnosis, the American Society of Clinical Hypnosis, the International Society of Hypnosis, and find out what other people are doing and uh, uh, the relevance to what we're all trying to do, which is help people. So, yeah, help yeah. People. so I, I would encourage people to visit your website and uh, um, put a plug for signing up for your uh, newsletter. It's a very uh, richly informed, relevant newsletter, and I always look forward to getting it, reading it, and learning from it. So marvelous resources there. Mm. Thank you. Appreciate that. Well, well, thank you, Rob. Thanks for asking me to do this. As always, a pleasure talking to you. So. Take yeah. care. Yeah, very nice. Thanks again, Michael.